Uh, so um, uh, I'll start out and then I'll hand off to Earl Mays, the project manager, and then he'll hand off to Cynthia Phillips. Uh, but we, of course, are representing an incredibly uh, large and, and wonderful team. Uh, next slide, please. Today, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail on our science goals and objectives. We've uh, had the wonderful opportunity to present to OPAG on a number of occasions. And our reference document is still the 2016 Science Definition Team Report, shown it right there. And our high-level goals uh, are to search for signs of life, uh, signs of evidence of, of life on Europa's surface and in, in the near subsurface, to assess Europa's habitability with in situ techniques, uh, and to investigate the geology and geophysics of Europa to provide context for future exploration. Uh, next slide, if I could. So when last we uh, saw you all pre-COVID, um, our game plan was to have this in situ science and instrumentation workshop for the exploration of Europa and ocean worlds. This was going to be a three-day event at JPL and Caltech. We had 467 people registered, 162 abstracts, and we had lots of energy and excitement from the planetary science community plus a lot of newcomers. We had biologists, oceanographers, geobiologists, cryospheric scientists um, uh, that had registered and submitted abstracts. But then as we all know, COVID hit. Uh, next slide, please. And so we transformed that three-day uh, workshop into a virtual workshop uh, spanning two hours on May 14th. And this is the uh, the agenda, I won't go through this in detail, but basically what our team wanted to do was to provide at least um, some level of detail on the latest with the mission concept. We had 429 unique attendees, uh, and by unique, I mean that uh, Joe Pateski and team went through and looked for doubles where people were using multiple devices. Um, and so really quite uh, a, uh, an impressive number of attendees for this event. Next slide, please. Uh, and it was an incredible effort by an incredible team. Uh, this was early in the days of, uh, relatively early in the days of COVID. And so a lot of us were still trying to figure out how exactly to do such a, uh, a virtual event. Uh, and everybody worked really, really hard practicing several times to, uh, to make sure it all went off without a hitch. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, now we have these uh, resources from the workshop online. You can go to that website shown at the top there. We've got the slides up there, a PDF of the slides. We've got a video recording, uh, as well as links to uh, the Astrobiology Science Conference workshop and the Science Definition Team report all on that site. And uh, so I encourage you to go there if you wanna learn more about what we're presenting today. Obviously we've just got 20 minutes today but uh, um, all of the resources are gathered at that website. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to that end, uh, given the, the level of excitement, we asked our attendees whether or not they'd be interested in additional events. And uh, the answer was a resounding yes. And so we've, we're starting a, a speaker series. We're not entirely sure how often we'll do it. Maybe once every two months, maybe once every quarter. We don't want to do it too frequently because everybody is certainly overloaded. But um, coming up on September 17th is a talk by Miguel San Martin, a brilliant engineer who has worked so many different kinds of, of landings. And we're fortunate enough to have him on our team uh, for the Europa Lander mission concept. And Meg will be talking about safe landing on uncertain terrain the Pillars of Europa Lander Deorbit, Descent and Landing. And if you want to uh, attend that, you can register at the link shown uh, down below. Uh, and we've already got over 100 registrants and we hope that many of you out there will, uh, will join us uh, for that, that talk. Next slide, please. Uh, next, I just wanted to give a brief overview of where to find more information and what we submitted to the decadal survey process. On July 15th, we submitted two papers directly from our, our team. Uh, and there was also a third paper, the Network for Ocean Worlds uh, paper led by Sam Howell. 
the, the first paper on the past, present, and future role of biology and NASA's exploration of our solar system covers um, exactly what the title says. Uh, <laughs> what has been the role of biology in NASA missions? And I'll expand on that a bit in the, uh, in the upcoming slide. Cynthia Phillips uh, spearheaded a wonderful uh, community paper on an exploration strategy for Europa that goes from Clipper to someday getting into the ocean below. Uh, I encourage you to, to check out all of those papers if you have time. And then for the August 15th deadline, we submitted a paper on the science of the Europa lander mission concept. And there you can find updates uh, and essentially sort of an executive summary that brings you from the science definition team report through our MCR and our Delta MCR, which was held in November of 2018. Uh, we passed that Delta MCR in 2018 with, um, with very high marks. Uh, coupled with that Science of the Europa Lander Mission concept paper, Ray Crum uh, led a paper on advanced technology developments that we're currently undertaking for the Europa Lander Mission concept and other in situ ocean world missions. Uh, you heard a wonderful talk from Shannon this morning and there's a, a lot of great um, development that's going on that can advance uh, our ability to land on distant ocean worlds, whether it's Europa or many of these other um, uh, bodies in the outer solar system. Uh, and then Glenn Reeves uh, also led a, um, a paper on the development of autonomous actions to enable the next decade of ocean world exploration. Autonomy really is quite an enabling technology, whether it's for Europa lander or a, a Venus mission or any of these missions that go many astronomical units out into, uh, into our solar system. And last, there's a planetary protection paper led by Brian Clement that covers not just the Europa lander, but also many of these other ocean worlds missions and planetary protection uh, as a whole. Next slide, please. So I'll just finish up with this. Uh, these are two images from two of those papers that I just mentioned on the left is, uh, is a snapshot from the, the biology paper and on the right is a snapshot from the, the science paper. And what we're showing on the left here is uh, we just went through all of the different missions, flagship, new frontiers, discovery missions, and graded them according to the fundamental disciplines to which they were mo most responsive. And by fundamental disciplines, I mean physics, geology, chemistry, and biology. And not surprisingly, as you can see, biology has not um, had much of a role uh, in uh, past missions. And that's to some extent for good reason. We obviously need to do much of the reconnaissance of the solar system. We need to understand the physics, geology, and chemistry as we lead up to biological investigations. But part of what is tremendously exciting about the time in which we live is that for the first time in the history of humanity, we can engage in this civilization scale science of exploring these worlds to investigate whether or not signs of life exist. We can then begin to engage biology uh, as a science in our missions and begin to understand whether or not biology is a universal phenomenon. And to that end, on the right is a, um, uh, a snapshot of the, the opening of our, of our Science of the Europa Lander Mission concept paper. And we sent this out and we had over 150 co-signers representing a balance of, uh, and diversity of, of scientific disciplines. And we made this pie chart that uh, I think is really quite powerful. Normally in a planetary science mission, you would see a lot of physics and geology and engineering. But as you can see for this mission concept, we have equal representation or excitement, uh, if you will, from biology and uh, a lot of excitement also from uh, chemists. And I think that's, that's quite powerful. The, the scientific diversity that is engaged by NASA's missions, I think is, is critical to our, our path forward. Uh, and so with that, I'll hand it over to Earl Mays who will uh, brief you on some of the, the architecture and technology developments that we're working on. All right. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks again uh, for inviting us to speak yet again. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to reconvene all these science discussions. Uh, so just to, I'm going to speak a little bit on our advanced development efforts. Uh, and just to remind you again of, of what our mission concept looks like, we're going to launch on SLS Block 1B. We've got a five-year quick cruise to Jupiter. 
Um, and then we need two years to kind of shape the orbits for a proper Europa landing. And then um, we will uh, deorbit, descend, and start the surface mission. Now in our advanced development, almost exclusively, we are looking at the last two boxes on the right here. Deorbit, descent, and landing, there's a lot of risk there and a lot of risk in the surface mission. So most of our advanced development is in our, almost all of it's in those two areas. Next slide, please. In the descent and deorbit uh, phase, the green boxes here are the areas where we are working hard to retire risk. Uh, we're gonna use a solid rocket motor to, to decelerate into a landing profile. Those things have, a, um, it's gonna be five years in cruise and a lot of radiation, so we need to retire risk on it. And we need to develop engines that can handle the lower gra gravity of uh, landing on Europa. But I want to emphasize mostly right now the GNC sensor pods. We have an intelligent landing system that's going to essentially do hazard avoidance and, and terrain mapping uh, on the landing, which we will have chosen a priori. We've got two contractors online right now to build uh, competing sensors, if you will. Both of them just went into phase three and are now building brass boards for these, uh, the LIDARs, the key components of this system. And um, we should be doing field testing in about another year and a half. Uh, next slide, please. On the surface mission, we're doing a lot of things. Again, the green boxes point towards the places where we are trying to retire risk the landing system in the belly pan, robotic arms and instruments. But what I wanted to emphasize this time was the batteries. We have baseline primary batteries and uh, we are working very hard to get the specific energy of these things up as high as we can with a very capable contractor. We're using the lithium CI, uh, CFX uh, technology, which is a very high specific energy, but we want to push it even higher. So we're working to get the uh, radiation and performance of these up. Right now our batteries give us 32 days of 50 kilowatt hours per, uh, and that's allocated up into seven days of prime mission, seven days of contingency, seven days of on-surface margin, and 11 days of unallocated margin. So even with the 11 days of unallocated margin, we decided to initiate a trade study to see if we couldn't get a little bit more out of this system. So let's go to the next slide, please. What we had was the 32 days, and we decided to start looking at surface lifetime. This is a uh, study led by Ray Crum, our flight system manager. Uh, we wanted additional contingency for, contingency for anomalies and to get more, just more mission. And what we found by poking at the margins that we had in the system, we could get 50 days of surface mission at almost no cost. A uh, few simple changes on the battery pack modules, uh, and then that use advanced development on the primary batteries themselves, their higher capacity, and we can preserve our dry mass and tank margins. But if we wanted to go even more, we could get 90 days by going back and looking at the entire system design. So we really do have, essentially, a, with, a, with re-engineering the, uh, the entire mission, which of course we're we capable of doing now, we can get our almost triple the capacity mission, mission time on the surface of, uh, of Europa. So that's been a, a very, very positive result. Next slide, please. Oh, we're gonna see the movie, cool. This is in our landing system. Some of you may have seen this before, but this is a animation to start with, but I'm gonna, we're gonna show you our, our test bed landing system. This is, the, this is the lander coming in in real time, the belly pan touches, pyros fire, and those legs lock. This is a triptych view of the same thing. Uh, we've got a much longer version of this that you can see on our webpage that Kevin mentioned earlier, uh, showing lots of different things. Uh, the sound didn't quite come through, but it's quite noisy, um, and you, you ought to get, go off and enjoy those. I think they're actually on, on YouTube. These have all been cleared for um, unlimited release. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So, oh, we're going to do it again. So let's go to the next slide, please. Just a quick run through of our, uh, some of the technology we're doing. These are the, the knee joints for the landing legs. Uh, if, if guys have been working in machine shops. And I should say that despite COVID, it's really slowed us down, but almost everybody's back on lab now that, that can do touch work. And so we're making progress. Uh, and that's, those are in the mechanical lab. Solid motor testing at, uh, at Marshall. Our high gain antenna just went through vibe test and very successfully, we we're very pleased with that. Our motor control, we've we tested and completed one of the, the first motor control card. We continue to torture our batteries at Sandia and uh, uh, Sandia is also developing energetic material for our planetary protection 
uh, sorry, yes, pine tree protection uh, end of mission. Next slide, please. So I see, um, you've seen this slide many times, uh, and these are our 14 instruments, or actually 13 instruments plus one handling system. Uh, what I wanted to take away from this one was the excitement of the workshop um, and other uh, if outreach part. We now have six more instruments that have kind of come into the, um, to the organization. They are not funded by IC, they are using internal funding, but they're interacting with us more or less in the same way in terms of understanding how the lander is built and how to, how to accommodate their instruments to the lander. And we're, of course, trying to understand how to accommodate the lander to these various uh, new instruments and new instrument types. Uh, I'll leave you to check these out in, in detail uh, in the slides. Uh, next slide, please. What I did want to do is talk about one of the 14. This is actually the, the one out of the 14 that's not an instrument. This is the Academy system. It's a sample transferring system that's being built by our partners at Goddard um, Space Flight Center led by uh, Mailspin. And it's really quite clever. From the outside, it looks the same to the sampling system. To the inside, uh, every instrument has a little bit of its own little channel. So I'll just walk you through this briefly. The sampling arm deposits material into a cup that the, the Academies has prepared for it. That cup is then taken inside the lander, rotated around to the entry port for the instrument, and then slide two, you can see the arm rotates to the, to the part where the, um, uh, it's there at the instrument port. A gripper then extends into the instrument's receiving room with a full sample cup and drops off the cup and then comes back out. You can see a, a close-up of the, uh, the cup over on the other side. So on one side, it looks exactly the same to the sampling system. On the other side, there's a little essentially color wheel of, uh, or I should say instrument uh, wheel, where it drops off these instruments uh, in, a, in pretty much the same way. And with that, I uh, placed through those, but I think I managed to stay on schedule. I'm going to pass this over to Cynthia Phillips, who's going to talk a little bit about the recon focus. Great. Thanks a lot, Earl. Um, so I'd like to give an update on what we've been doing with reconnaissance. So. This is a joint Europa Clipper, Europa Lander Reconnaissance Focus Group. It's one of the official um, Europa Clipper focus groups. And we've been meeting now for about two years. And this focus group is led by myself on the Europa Lander side and Alfred McEwen on the Europa Clipper side um, with Jennifer Scully as our facilitator. And so the charge for this group is really to help Europa Clipper gather the best possible data set for a future landed mission to Europa. And that includes two different important data sets. So first is the data that we'll use for landing site selection. And this is data that where we take into account both engineering safety and science value. So we're looking for a location on the surface. Um, if you remember from the brief video that Earl just showed about how the intelligent landing system works, um, we want a position on the surface where we can actually land safely, where the terrain is not too rugged, but we also want a place that's interesting from a scientific point of view. And so this is the data set we use for landing site selection, but we also have a second data set. And this is what we use during the landing phase itself for terrain relative navigation. So if you remember from Earl's charts, um, as the space surf comes down, we have different phases of the landing um, where we use information that's already placed on board the spacecraft to match with images of the surface that are taken during the landing phase itself. Um, and this is what's used to navigate to the landing site, the chosen place on the surface that we actually want to land. And so here's just a little simulation of what landing site selection and what, what the gathering of these data sets might look like. Um, so on the left is some of our highest resolution data for Europa taken by the Galileo spacecraft. Um, and in the yellow box is a nominal uh, two by 10 kilometer, what we're calling a landing region. This would be a, a high resolution stereo portion of the surface observed by Europa Clipper. And then if we zoom in on the right here, um, within that two by 10 kilometer landing region, we can fit dozens and dozens of our notional 200 meter ellipse landing sites. So that's what these little orange circles are. And so you can see within one landing region, um, a landing region would be observed on one close approach, 
approach flyby by Europa Clipper, we have many potential landing sites that we can distribute over the surface. Um, so we can find places that are interesting scientifically, that are safe engineering wise, and we can also exclude um, some of the regions which I've just marked in purple for this exercise, places where we think the scarps are too tall to allow us to land safely. Uh, so next slide, please. So the current status of this work is that we've just completed a study on the Europa Lander side of whether or not we could use Europa Clipper mapping data that's taken from a 100 kilometer altitude close approach for the terrain relative navigation landing phase, um, rather than the 50 kilometer altitude that the Europa Lander project had previously baselined. Um, and so the results of the study um, were very successful. And so what this means is that we'll be able to use relatively lower resolution data, so data um, with a resolution um, as high as 22 meters per pixel um, for this terrain relative navigation portion. And so the trade-off is that this may result in increased errors in our landing ellipse, um, but the relaxed constraints allow us to open up more potential landing sites. So basically we'll be able to use observations that are taken on many more of Europa Clippers flybys of Europa um, that'll be at, at altitudes that range, close approach altitudes ranging from 50 up to 100 kilometers. And this helps us to ensure geographic diversity of potential landing sites and increase our potential science value of a chosen landing site. And so we'll be submitting these uh, reconnaissance planning guidelines to the Europa Clipper science team. Um, and this will be accommodated on a best efforts basis. So these are not requirements, but these are a metric that future, um, that, that future uh, tour designers will be able to use as they're optimizing their tours to meet all of the requirements, then they'll be able to also look and see what, how good a job it does with the various planning guidelines. And so future work for this fall, um, we've, we've had a meeting of the, of the complete joint Europa Clipper, Europa Lander focus group. We'll be reporting out to the whole Europa Clipper science team later this month, um, as we'll have some discussion later this month as well at the upcoming Europa Clipper PSG meeting. And we'll be publishing a study um, next year. Basically, we'll be publishing a paper that goes through our whole plans for um, Europa reconnaissance strategy. Um, we expect that sometime uh, during, during the next year. And that's all I have. Thank you.